Good afternoon, Max. How are you doing? I'm very good, Peter. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right, man. A little bit of a hangover this morning. Yeah, what might that be about? It might huh? be about those full fat old fashions we were having last night. <laughs> but they were good, man. The infused butter. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That was something. If so, Seriously. If, if you've not been to Hawksmoor in London, you need to go. <laughs> yeah. Anyone listening. And by the way, I'm fully off the wagon now. I don't know, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you know. I, don't, I, I had a bet with Michael Malice. Uh -huh. So I, uh, I interviewed him at the start of the year. I was like, yeah, I've stopped drinking. I think I'm going to do the whole year. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> I was like, no, I am. I'll bet you. A, and he was like, a, initially, we we're going to bet a whole Bitcoin. And he was like, no, I'm not doing that. And Danny was like, do it. People, people definitely not do the whole year. And he was like, no, we'll do a dinner. And I did 44 days. Ah, you see, yeah, that's something though. But you made the year without the vaping. That was, that no, was good. No, no, you didn't? No, I completely failed on that as well. Oh, really? Yeah, every, I, Max, I failed on everything. Really? I thought you managed that for the year. Nope. Oh. I completely failed. Well, that's some high time preference right there. I know, I know. <laughs> Don't keep telling me that, honestly. <laughs> Did you just see me sneaking it at the table last night? <laughs> I was like sneaking it, but uh, no, it was a good dinner, man. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. London you, is a cool town, man. It's my first time here. It's nice. What? Yeah. Yeah. Bro, my, my first time in the UK was visiting you in Bedford. And now my first time in London is visiting you again. What? I know. I, I can't know. believe this is your first time in London. Yeah. Hold on. You've lived in Europe for your whole life. Yeah. And you've never come to London. No. Why not? I don't know. Bad weather, bad food. <laughs> Shut up, man. The food's good. Some of That's it's what good. I heard. Some That's of what I heard. Good. But then that bone broth yesterday, that was like, ah, you know. So. So what have you done in London then? Have you been to uh, Buckingham Palace? No. No, nothing. No, I got from the airport to the Advancing Bitcoin conference. And that's then from the conference to here. That's that's my London trip so far. Oh, man. And you're not staying? Bitcoiners. No, heading out tonight. Uh, how was the conference? It was great. It was great, really. Uh, nice to have some dense uh, gathering of technical people to you know talk and brainstorm about things. Very productive. Lots oh, of new insights. So it's a nerd conference. A uh, total nerd conference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who, who's speaking? A uh, bunch of people were speaking. Uh, Ruben Thompson was there. Uh, Stick. Uh, uh, Eric Sirion. Uh, you know, a bunch of people really like about uh, uh, Lightning Network improvements and some some privacy stuff. It was, a, it was a nice deep dive. Stick's coming to the football this weekend. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we've got him in on the football. Nice. I'm not going to talk too much about football. I got complaints <laughs> last time. Stop talking about football. <laughs> um, was my boy Conor Rokas there? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, he's playing for you, right? No, he played last season, a couple of games. Oh, this season no more? No, he's uh, he's retired. Oh, he's too old for it now. He's lost it. He's lost his touch. <laughs> he's going to kill me for saying that. <laughs> well, listen, look, uh, we had, um, you know, my boy Ben Prentice. He's great. Yeah. That I, episode with him, stellar. Man. Well, Proud of him. Yeah, and so, look, I, I love Ben. and uh, But he said the number one person to talk to about Austrian economics is Max. That's your guy. He was like, you've got to talk to Max. I mean, yeah. he's like... I am just a mere student of Max. <laughs> Max is the guy. And yeah. so Danny is like, when you talk to Max, you've got to grill him. You've got to grill him on Austrian economics. Yeah. What's, your, what's your background in it? Um, you know, I was always interested in economics and entrepreneurship. Uh, I started pretty young just hustling, you know, handing out newspapers, working in kitchens, etc., to earn some money. And so I was always interested in the entrepreneurial well, spirit, let's say. Um, and I wanted to get some theoretical understanding to get better at it. And so I picked up some Keynesian economics books, you know, the mainstream stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was my reaction too. Like either I'm completely stupid or this just doesn't make sense at all. Um, and then I looked for alternatives and ultimately found the Austrian school uh, and just did a big deep dive into Mises, Rothbard, Hoppe. Um, and... It was just a hobby for me, pre-Bitcoin, you know, so I had a good understanding of the, the horrible poison that, that fiat money is and how beautiful gold is as an alternative. But, you know, of course, in the 21st century, gold just doesn't cut it anymore. We're living in cyberspace now. And so meat space money just is no good. Um, and that made me pretty depressed, you know, because you see the, the how bad fiat is and that gold won't fix it. Right? And, well, what do you do then? Right? Uh, until you discover Bitcoin, and you're like, "Oh, no, that's something. Right? This is this is actually a digital money that's as good as gold, arguably even better, right? and it it can really be used to end the the fiat empire." 
So you were a uh, gold bug first? Yeah, definitely. Oh. Yeah. And, and so when the uh, Bitcoin thing came along, was it, did it instantly make sense? You're like, yeah, I get it, that's it. Uh, no, surprisingly not. Like the first time I heard about it, I, I didn't have anything major against it, but it didn't really spark my interest, which is actually super weird, you know, because I had the economics and to some extent a bit of a technical background, at least interest in free and open source software. And somehow it didn't instantly gather my my enthusiasm. Uh, I took a couple approaches, a couple touch points, um, and yeah, then eventually I, I, you know, it made click. Well, we've got a, we've got someone we can orange pill right now. Oh. Because Danny, Danny's not here. Yeah. Because we tried to fit this in. Danny had to go back to Australia. Poor guy's been working so hard. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have a on-site producer in today yeah. who uh, doesn't know much about Bitcoin. And so I think, uh, I think th through me, let's try and, uh, let's try an orange pillar and we'll see what happens afterwards. So. You know, you talked then. You talked about how bad fiat money is. Tell our through me. Tell our on-site producer today why it's so bad. Yeah, well, there's multiple reasons, right? For one, you don't make the rules. Uh, in fact, some you know unelected board of of people and bureaucrats come up with the rules of that monetary system, and including the most important rule of how much money is there. Uh, and in fact, these guys don't even know exactly about the money that is in circulation. It's a bit like Ethan. <laughs> Basically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, and and so you 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 don't make the rules, and you cannot verify the rules, and which basically means these people can just print a bunch of money and increase the money supply, uh, and put it in their own pockets or the pockets of their friends. And uh, inflation, the increase of the money supply, uh, kicks off the Cantillon effect, uh, which basically means that we move capital or wealth from those people who received. Uh, newly or to those people who received the newly printed money first, they get all the capital from those people who who received the newly created money later. And that's that wealth transfer that happens whenever you print a single piece of currency. Uh, and it's an economic law there and there's no way around it. And, and the the crazy thing is this is somewhat of a like never ending chain of theft. Right, so the 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 higher up you're you're in 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 that you know flow of of newly created money, uh, then from the more people you steal, right? If you're if you're at the very top, um, you know you get all the all the capital. Nobody's stealing from you, and you get some of the capital from everyone else. Uh, but then that person whom the first guy gives the money to, you know, he's that second position now. He already got stolen from from the person who received the money first. Right? So it's bad if you're not at the very top, you get stolen from, uh, which means basically everyone is being stolen from. But the really, really shitty part is like, you know, you living in, in UK or somewhere in Europe or, or America, um, sure, you're not the very first to receive the money, but you're also not the very last. Right? There's millions, billions of people who want to get that money that was just printed and who will eventually, after years, decades uh, of the trickle-down effect, ultimately receive it. Uh, so this means that, that you and me, you know, for every day we, we get paid in fiat currency where we receive this newly created money, we're, we were being stolen from, from a bunch of people, but we're stealing from even more people in the past. And then the real treachery of fiat is that it turns the, the everyday Joe just when you, you want to earn money and spend it, but it, it tricks you into being a thief. Uh, and that's what makes this entire system like corrupt and evil to the core. Right. I'm going to hazard a guess that might have gone straight over your head a little bit. So I'm going to make you work a little bit harder on this one, Max. I'm going to make you work a little bit harder to explain this. So just, just so you know, fiat money is pounds, dollars, euros, so you know what that is. But I can imagine somebody who's listened to this the first time is, is thinking, what do you want about? I, my bank account has got the same money as in last week. I'm not being stolen from. What do you mean? Can you, like, in the most simple terms possible, explain to me how my pounds are being stolen from me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, be, um, it's all about the, the relative ratio of the total money supply to how much you have. Okay. Think of it, there's a big cake on, on the table and you have a slice of it. And, and uh, let's say that uh, that slice is 10% of the total cake. You know, you have 10% of the money supply, let's say. Um, and, and that's great, right? Um, however, let's increase the money supply. Someone prints a bunch of money right? and you're not the one getting it. Right? The, the guy who printed the money gets it first. Who's printing? What are you on about printing money? 
well, you know, wh whoever is doing that. You're the, not the government. The, the, the central, central banks okay. uh, and governments, yes. They're, um, it's it's a it, kind of intricate system of how exactly they print the money, but ultimately they just print the money. Meaning, let's say the size of the cake gets bigger, but your uh, slice stays the nominal same amount, right? You had 100 pounds before, you have 100 pounds after. Didn't seem like you, anything changed much, right? But the cake got bigger, and you have a much smaller percentage point of that now. Instead of, let's say, 10%, you only have 5%. But, I, you know, I've been going for 44 years, Max. I've never really, I've not really noticed the difference. I don't know. I think you do, right? There's there's this concept of the seen and the unseen. Okay. Right? And uh, the, like, sure, you know, we could think, hey, look, we have all these magic, you know, microphones, cameras, all these new cool technologies. This is great, right? We're super wealthy. Well, yeah, sure. But how wealthy would we have been if we wouldn't have stolen from each other all the time, right? How much how much more capital could we have amassed? How much more technologies could we have built uh, if we just wouldn't steal from each other all the time? Well, I did notice this morning after I got up this morning, I wanted a coffee. I went into this uh, bakery and they had these nice looking cookies. And she's like, do you want a box of cookies? I was like, yeah, I'm going to take these back to my uh, to my uh, kids and back to my dad. So I bought a box of cookies. Yeah. It was 25 pounds yeah. for a box of six fucking cookies. <laughs> so things are getting more expensive. But like, um, and that's more of a flippant joke. But uh, what it was reported this week uh, is that uh, grocery inflation in the UK hit 17.1%. Mm. Now listen, there's multiple factors that come into this. Yeah, th there is a war and we do know there is uh, issues with transportation of certain food stocks. We know there's um, uh, issues with... Uh, the energy sector and the cost of producing food in the UK, we can't put that all on the money printing, right? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think the money printing is definitely the that root cause that we can clearly identify. Um, because so once you print money, again, right, we, we shift capital from some people or from the vast majority of people to those people who received the newly created money first. Now, now those people uh, that received the, the money are a lot richer meaning they're going to invest into more things now, right? If, if you have more money, you're going to do more with it, right? All right, let's go back a step. Let's make this even easier to understand. Uh, back, to, This is the Cantillian effect you're talking about. Okay, mm -hmm. how do you mean? Like, literally talk me through the steps of the people printing the money that goes to the richer people. How does that happen? Like, firstly, why is the government printing the money? And how is it getting into the hands of the riches first? Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, how they're printing the money is, is literally like a printer. You know, the physical bills that you have, yeah. that's the base money. That's the that's the ultimate money, like on the Bitcoin blockchain, like physical gold. Uh, that's kind of the same thing, right? And uh, the, the base money has two components. So it's the physical cash that's literally being printed. And then you have the central bank reserves. Uh, and this is basically a promise of the central bank that they will print the cash in the future. Right? So, uh, and this promise to print the cash is as good as the cash. Right? Both of these things are part of the base money supply of, of the fiat system. And not, so not just do they inflate by, by actually printing more, they also inflate by promising more that they're going to print more in the future. Right? And uh, that's especially been during COVID. Sure, the, the physical base money supply has increased, but the digital component that, that promised to print more, that has just skyrocketed like crazy. Um, and then to whom do all of these, to whom does this go to? Well, of course, first of all, the government. Right? That's how the government finances all of its debt, uh, is, is just by receiving that literally newly printed money. Um, as well as, for example, huge corporates. Uh, that's what bailouts are ultimately. Right? The Fed or the central bank prints a bunch of money and then gives the bailout to the banks who uh, you know, made some, who are in a bad shape, for example. Uh, or it can also go you know, to the individual uh, like person living, I think here in the UK, you you got like from the government some subsidy for the gas, right? Depending on who you are, I mean, yeah. I think they did one for. Uh, they, they're doing them actually for companies right now. I think mm -hmm. they just announced today they're going to have to extend it mm. because the gas and uh, electricity price is so high that a lot of companies, you know, a little bit like I talked about bakery, bakeries mm. or cafes may have to close down because they can't yeah. afford to uh, heat their property. I'm in. Um, told you last night, I'm in the process of buying a bar right now. And I've seen the management accounts, but I've also seen the most recent gas and electricity bills. Mm. They've gone up three hundred percent in the last few months. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are big. These are big cost increases for certain companies. Yeah, yeah. So let's dive deeper on on why that actually happened, right? Because it's it's not just. Or so first they printed a bunch of money, so a lot of capital got moved from from everyone 
to, to those who receive the money first. That's the first kind of wealth redistribution. And that's already bad because all of a sudden now you're poor, right? Which, which means you, you have to struggle more to, to you know, do your things. Uh, ho however, then, these people who just received all of the money, they're going to start investing it now much more than they otherwise would have. Right? And um, so we invest in projects that get worse and worse and worse. Right? Because the, the first time you receive money, you're going to invest it in the best project that you get, right? The highest return uh, on your investment, you're, you're going to put your money there. The, the next unit of money that you have, well, naturally, you can no longer put it in, into the best because you've, you've just done that, right? You've already invested in that one project. So naturally, you will have to invest in the second best and then the third best. And every, with every additional dollar, you're going to invest in marginally worse investment goods. Right? So we are basically investing in things that we don't really need that much. Uh, so to say, right? We're, we, we, uh, in, instead of just focusing our limited capital on, on just the creme de la creme of investments, we spray it everywhere. You know, everyone's investing in, in everything. Um, and this basically means we use up a lot of resources to build up these, these uh, production stages. Um, and we tend to make these production stages even more roundabout. And instead of having a very simple process to produce something, because we are so rich, we can make it fancy, we can introduce robots and lasers and, and whatnot to, to make the production, uh, you know, a bit more complex. Sure, we get something out of it. It's well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Surely you invest in robots and lasers to become more efficient, to become mm -hmm. more productive, to deliver a better return on your investment. Um, yeah, yes, exactly, right? But uh, uh, like... It just means that more capital is tied up in this specific process, All right? So let's say you you could produce a cookie or something by hand, yeah, you know, and uh, and that takes an hour of your time or something, or you could you know build a robot with you know a bunch of rare metals and you know silicon and software and all that, and that takes a long time to produce the robot, who then in thirty minutes can produce the cookie instead of. An, an, an but what's hour. wrong with that? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm just saying that we, we needed to invest a lot more capital in order to first build the robot so that we then can, can you know, do the cookie. Um, and here, th it just means that more capital is being tied up, right? And all the capital that we spend on building that robot is, is gone now. We cannot use it for something else to build a car or, or whatnot. Right, so that's, that's the first stage. We, we have malinvestment. We, we uh, build projects we don't really need and, and we spend way more capital on them than we actually would need to or th th than we otherwise would have. Let's say it like that. The second thing is mal uh, is overconsumption. Right? So because all of a sudden, yeah, because all of a sudden you have a bunch of new money, yeah. you know, you're going to buy six uh, box of six cookies, you know. Because oh, of, six oh. boxes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've over-consumed for the last few years. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so this basically means, you know, we have a limited amount of resources, but because we think that we're super rich, because I just got a new money printed to me, mm. I, I'm rich, so I can now consume on the stuff, you know, that I otherwise would not have consumed. And, and, and now you see this, this comes from two levels. For one, we invest much more capital I into investments, right? so that a lot of capital goes there. And simultaneously, we consume a lot more. Right? which means we, we reduce the capital that we have, right? We, we eat the food and then it's gone. Um, and this is a mismatch, right? We, we spend a bunch of money on investing new things, but which means we, we, we think that in the future we're going to get that capital back, but right now it's gone, right? We've, we've pushed that capital, allocated it now, hoping that we get more back in the future. Um, but simultaneously, we don't want to wait until the future to consume, we want to consume right now, right? And we are over-consuming right now. So not just did we lock up capital in these investments, we're also decreasing our capital stock right now instead of waiting for the profit that we have in the future. And that's a level of poverty. And that's why you see prices go up ultimately because the, the resources that we want to have, we've already invested them somewhere else uh, and we've already consumed most of them. So there's, there's literally not enough fuel left to heat the country. So are you against any idea of a central bank then? Um, I'm against any ideal of theft. Huh. Uh, and I I think that you could probably build a central bank that doesn't steal and that doesn't inflate. It's just very, I guess, unlikely. Because once you have the power to inflate, you're probably going to use it. And if we define the central bank as, as that entity that, that can inflate the money legally, uh, most likely you're going to do it. Right? 
So how do things change with Austrian economics? Somebody, if somebody's listened to the first time, I'm like, what do you want about this Austrian economics? I've never been to Austria. What, is, what the hell is this all about? <laughs> well, uh, you know, in the like late 1800s, uh, 1900s, a couple of really smart people were in Austria, in Vienna. Um, and there was a, a big uh, somewhat divide across multiple uh, disciplines, roughly saying between collectivism and individualism, so to say, right? So um, there was... On, in terms of psychology, right? There, there was a camp that was about the the collective psyche uh, and and like the the, the zeitgeist, etc. Uh, and then there was Carl Jung uh, and uh, Freud, Sigmund Freud, who who focused on the psyche of the individual, right? and that was a huge clash in Vienna that happened between uh, these two ideas of how to think about psychology. Uh, sim simultaneously, the same battle was happening in economics. Right, about collectivist economics, uh, things like Marx, for example, uh, and, and communism uh, came out of that idea, as well then the, the individualistic uh, uh, and uh, yeah the in individualistic focused economics, which is basically the what we now know as the Austrian school of economics or praxeology, where we analyze the consequences of human action, uh, and we can deduce things like what happens when we increase the money supply, what happens when we put a maximum a limit on the wages or a minimum price for, for certain goods. What are the consequences of this, economically speaking? See, you would have thought if you were making economic decisions for a country of 70 million people, that this would be something you would just naturally do. Like you should just be studying the consequences of these decisions. Yeah. But there's no there's no incentive to do it. Because yeah. the answers you come to would be that this is fucking nonsense. What are we doing here? Yeah, basically. So why do you think uh, Austrian economics hasn't really become a mainstream school of economics? I mean, it is, I think that's an unfair thing to say. It is a mainstream school. I'm aware of it. There's a lot of people aware yeah. of it. But why isn't this a standard of economics that uh, has really been understood outside of kind of these niche circles of maybe mm -hmm. gold bugs or Bitcoiners or libertarians? Because mm -hmm. it shouldn't be seen as radical, right? No, it's pretty common sense to be yeah. honest. I mean, it's not common, unfortunately, but, but it, it is common be. sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, it's a really good question, uh, and I think to some extent it was just about uh, like academia and people being tossed out of their positions if they, you know, were thinking about, you know, along these lines. Like there were a lot of people that uh, or universities that, when you would put some Austrian economics into your curriculum. Uh, you would just not get the job next year, basically. Why, though? It's um, a good question. Um, I think a, a lot of the you know current academia is is there kind of to uh, to defend the status quo, to de to defend uh, you know what is there. Like the there was again in, in Vienna, there was the the House of Hohenzollern, a uh, huge, rich, um, extremely wealthy, like. Uh, near royalty family for, for many, uh, yeah, long time in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, they, th th you know, they, they had a group of academics that they called uh, the intellectual bodyguard of the house uh, of, of Hohenzollern, right? So they, they, they really wanted to make sure that their uh, like prime position as, as being close to, to the center of power uh, will, will be defended on an ideological basis. Right? That that people think it's it's not just okay, but it's actually desirable uh, to have people in, at central points of control uh, in in the economy. Hmm. So, do you think now you've yeah you've been around in Bitcoin for a, quite a bit of time now? Is there an absolute natural fit between Bitcoin and Austrian economics, or is there any misalignment? No, I think it's it's spot on. It's uh, perfect. It's yeah. Satoshi is like the, the greatest living applied, or I'm not sure if he's living, but the greatest oh, yeah, you know applied him. economist. <laughs> <laughs> no, because like he, he obviously and very deeply understood the, the Austrian reasoning um, from, from you know, all of his writings yeah. and, and the importance of the fixed money supply, the importance of individual verification of the rules. Right? Um, all of this is, is deeply, deeply, deeply Austrian. Um, and, I, you know, I think that was... Almost, all, not all, but a lot of the cypherpunks were very much influenced by the likes of Murray Rothbard uh, and and others. Uh, so there is definitely a strong correlation uh, here, um, you know. And like for example, um, Hal Finney, one yeah. of his early comments was about uh, ba Bitcoin banks. 
you know, and, and the aspect of fractional reserving, uh, fractional reserves, etc., with Bitcoin banks. That's a that's like the the, the one of the root uh, causes of debates in in Austrian economics is banking and, and fractional reserve, etc. So it was definitely at the forefront or at, in the minds of the people working on Bitcoin very very early. So what what is that rooted debate with regards to the banks and fractional reserve? What there's a disagreement whether it can or can't work, should work, mm -hmm. should. What's the basis of the arguments? Um, yeah, so the, the it, it kind of it depends a lot on on what we're actually talking about. Um, for for example, there is this concept of a money warehouse. Mm -hmm. It's the very basics of a bank, so to say. And I have a gold coin. Give that gold coin to you uh, because you have a big metal box where you can lock it in and big guy with a gun in front of it to defend it. No, and now I'm hiring you as as my money warehouse. You store my money. And in exchange, you give me this little paper certificate that says, "Hey, Max owns one big or one gold coin in my vault, for example." Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so this could be written on on my name specifically, right? That that only I can come to you to get back that gold coin, um, yep. or it can be whoever has this piece of paper has the right to get that gold, uh, one gold coin back. And right? so I can take this piece of paper, give it to someone else. And then that person comes to you, and you will give him the the gold back. Because the note is a promise. Exactly. Right. The the note is basically a a, a promise to to withdrawal, uh, or a demand deposit. It's often called. Um, but of course, the physical piece of paper is not the same thing as the as the physical piece of gold. Of course. And right? so the question is, what's the price difference between the gold and the paper? Right? If you're a extremely reputable money warehouse with highest security standards and you know yeah. lots of ethics and you're never going to steal from anyone, then there's a high chance that the the paper and the gold coin trade at par. Uh, meaning that whenever I say hey, I want to get a gram of gold uh, and someone gives me a gram of gold promised from your money warehouse, I'm, I'll be happy. Right? And I'm, I won't charge anything extra just because it's the piece of paper. Hmm. Um, but so then what happens... If, let's say, you have a uh, 100 grams of gold in your vault, but you issue, instead of 100 paper certificates, 200. Right? Now, all of a sudden, uh, there's 200 claims on the gold out there, but there's only 100 pieces of gold. And who would know? And who would know? Exactly. Because very often, like, sure, maybe, you know, once a day someone comes and picks up a gram of gold, but almost never does someone come and pick up 100 grams of gold, right? Everything. Yeah. yeah. So if you just hand out more paper receipts, like, sure, maybe someone, you know, then every day two grams of gold gets gets withdrawn, let's say. But that's still not 100. Mm -hmm. So you can fractional reserve, so to say, with, without it being noticed. I got I to gotta read a quote. This is, Danny read this to me this morning. You got to talk to me about um, young Guido Holzman. Jörg Guido Hülsmann. Oh, I got close. <laughs> Jörg Guido ah, Hülsmann. Hülsmann. Sehr gut. Is that a German name? He's German. Yeah. He's German. German, and uh, I think his wife is French, oh. and he's living in France. Ich heiße Jörg Guido Hülsmann. Sehr gut. <laughs> um, all right, okay. So he wrote The Ethics of Money Production. I've Beautiful actually book. never read it. I, so good. I've got it at home. I've just never got around to it. So good. Ah. Oh. Is that, and the crazy thing is, he published that in 2007, which I think yeah. is definitive proof that Hülsmann is, in fact, Satoshi. <laughs> That's why I said to Daddy this morning, I was like, is this guy Satoshi? <laughs> All right, listen, I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this quote. Okay. An, an economic good that is defined entirely in terms of bits and bytes is unlikely ever to be produced spontaneously on a free market. Mm -hmm. And despite the dedicated efforts of various individuals and associations, no such money has ever has in fact ever been produced since the creation of the internet made electronic payments possible. At present, only government money has been produced in electronic form. These new electronic techniques of dealing with money are very efficient and beneficial, but they must not be confused with the creation of electronic money. So let's just say mm -hmm. that first again. An, an economic good that is defined entirely in terms of bits and bytes. So, I mean, it's a fascinating thing for him to say. And the fact that he mm -hmm. wrote this, the book came out in 2008, and he was right, right? Up he was at that absolutely point. Absolutely right. <laughs> was this was he at all wrapped up in the kind of cypherpunk scene or anything like that? I don't think so, to be honest. No, um, no he's a no, he was he was very definitely very much involved in the Austrian 
uh, rabbit hole for sure. Okay. And yes, there was some overlap. But if he ever read the cypherpunk mailing list or or wrote there, I'm not sure. Uh, we, it would be interesting to check if he ever got quoted on the cypherpunk mailing list. Hmm. That would be quite interesting. But you've met him, right? You've orange pilled him. Yes. Okay. Uh, in fact, he was orange pilled before I met him. Oh, was he? Yeah, yeah. That's just yet another sign that he's in fact Satoshi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in terms of if, when, when he talks about an economic good that is mm. defined entirely of bits and bytes. Yeah. Okay. What's he, an economic good? It's the first right. question. Well, yes. Okay. Right. So the an economic good is a scarce and rivalrous resource. Okay. So what does scarce mean? Scarce means there is a potential of conflict over who can utilize this resource. Right. So, you know, the piece of paper in front of me, either you hold it or I hold it. There's no way that we could both at the same time hold and use the same piece of paper for different reasons, right? Or for different uses. Uh, that just doesn't work. Uh, th this unit is scarce. Either you use it or I use it, right? Um, uh, then the, the other thing is how much, like, is it super abundant? Is there a lot of it? Think of it like the air in this room, right? There's, there's a lot of it here. Uh, however, air is still a scarce resource. And you realize that when you go underwater and you have like a bottle of pressurized air with you, right, either I breathe it or you. Mm. If there's not enough air molecules in this bottle for both of us, then we have a, a conflict over who can use the scarce resource that is limited in quantity, where the, the supply that we have is less or not enough uh, to satisfy all of the needs that we have. Right? So we can have super abundant scarce resources like air in, in this case. Uh, but ultimately, it's still scarce. Then th the next part, what are bits and bytes? Right? Bits and bytes is not numbers, right? Ones and zeros. Uh, it's information. Uh, information is not scarce, fundamentally. Right? If, if I say the word zero, that doesn't hinder you from using the word zero or the, the number zero in, in your math. Right? Mm -hmm. it's when uh, we can share information, we can copy it. Right? I can't copy this piece of paper but I can copy the words that are on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a big, big, big fundamental difference because this means now, regardless of how much the demand is for this piece of knowledge, well, I can copy it and satisfy any demand at infinitum. Right? So that, that means that information is not scarce and therefore it cannot be rivalrous and therefore it is not an economic good. Okay. Right? Um, and so what, what he's basically saying is that a money has to be scarce. A money has to be rivalrous. Mm -hmm. A single coin of, of money must only be used by one person at one time for one task. Right? You cannot use the same gold coin and pay two different people with it. Nope. You know how Satoshi, Satoshi called this? The double spending double problem. Spend problem yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what Hilsman is saying here. The double spending problem has not been solved unless we add or we introduce the government. Right? Because what, what we can say is, like, okay, he overhears the government and that government says which transaction came first, mm. basically. And that central party that we all trust and that has full control uh, and that we cannot verify, right? they say, okay, this is the real coin and, and this copy of the coin is fake, so to say. Hmm. Um, which, you know, of course sucks because now we have to trust this third party with, with, with doing this. Um, and... What, what Satoshi found out is that we can, in fact, use software and, and speech uh, in order to establish or in order to solve the double spending problem to establish scarcity, rivalrousness in cyberspace without relying on a single trusted third party. Hmm. Right? Every one of us can create new units of Bitcoin. It's not just limited to the government that only they can create new units of, of money which is what they do with, with digital uh, fiat yeah. currencies, right? But with Bitcoin, everyone can do it, right? Because we all have a, a, a system of, of rules that we define, verify, and enforce on our individual computers as, as Bitcoin full nodes. And so every full node is the issuer, so to say, uh, of the rules and the monetary tokens. Right? And, and we have a clear set of rules on who gets to spend the token first, the miners, yep. those who find the block, and then whoever is at the tip of the you know, chain of signatures uh, that, that transfer the, the coins to the next person. You're going to laugh when I tell you why that took so long. Is anyone listening? I just went to get coffee because I'm tired. <laughs> Max, Am I boring you Max, with this conversation? No, Max kept me out drinking late. <laughs> no, the, um, 
the uh, the payment won't work. <laughs> ah, yeah, there you go. Payment won't work. So did they take Bitcoin? No, of course they don't fucking take Bitcoin. <laughs> Plus, you know what? My uh, my blue wallet's empty of sats. So I need to load mm. that up. Oh yeah, public service announcement. But Blue Wallet is shutting down their Lightning Wallet. What? Yes. Hold on. <laughs> so get your money out. I think you have another. Couple Are you weeks. releasing that exclusively? No, now? they they announced it a couple couple days ago. Why? Why are they doing that? Uh, because the technology that they use, L and D Hub, yeah, uh, is kind of a piece of crap. Okay. And they kind of scaled too much. Like Blue Wallet has a shit ton of users. And yeah. It's kind of overwhelming. Um, so it's been too good for them. Side. It's it, yeah, they're they're too successful, basically. Um, and now they're uh, plus you know it's this custodial thing, yeah. which was always kind of a hack. Uh, the Blue Wallet started as a non-custodial wallet for yeah. on chain and multi-sig, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And what they're working on now is to work on a non-custodial Lightning implementation uh, with LDK. Right? So in Blue Wallet you'll have non-custodial Lightning soon. I'm, I'm guessing they're gonna you know as soon as they shut down their custodial offering, they're gonna do the non-custodial one. You think they're ready to go with it? I think so. I, th I think it's been working for a while, actually. And actually, what am I on about? I'm I'm an absolute liar. I have got sats on here. <laughs> Do you know why? Because of Nostra. Mm -hmm. People uh, keep zapping you. Yeah, it's amazing. So I talk shit on there all the time. So I got wallet Satoshi. People are like, put your thing in. Let me zap you. Um, <laughs> right. I've I've got forty dollars of. I had 178,000 sats sent to me on it. There you go. Yeah. So you don't own any Bitcoin. Right, i tell you what we're going to do. We, I'm going to give you all the Bitcoin I've been given on Nostra. <laughs> I'm going to give you $40 of Bitcoin, but you have to download a Bitcoin wallet. Okay. You're just going to get free money. There's no reason to say no to this. But so if you download, what wallet, what wallet would you recommend? It's a good question. All right, so the... Um question is, do you want to do it properly or not? Right? You can go to a money warehouse, like Wallet of Satoshi, or you can actually hold the money yourself. This is our friend right? Sophia's first that, venture into the world of Bitcoin. And that's why it should be a proper start to get right. things going. Right? What do you uh, reckon? Do, do you, do you have iOS? Yeah. Uh, then uh, Phoenix. The Phoenix Wallet, right. Phoenix you download the Phoenix iOS. Wallet, yeah. and at the end of this interview, I'm giving you all of the, all the Bitcoin I've been generously donated via Nostra. Do you like Nostra? I love it. It's I, really cool. Yeah. It's, do you know what's really interesting about it? I'm sorry because we're deviating now. I'm all over the place. But I go on Twitter and I feel dirty. Mm. I feel shit. I'll post something. You know, it might be an interesting point and it's just like, yeah, fuck you, man. Yeah. Like all people just being absolute bellends. And then, um, and then I'll go on Nostra and post something. And yeah, there's the odd pushy dickhead. But like it's great conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You get... You get more answers, mm -hmm. quicker, mm -hmm. and better. Mm -hmm. And so for the, for its niche, it's totally working. What I hope yep. they do is they scale that niche to other niches so other people come in. Yeah. And become, because it would be sad if Nostro is just like a Bitcoin chat room. Mm. That would be sad. Yeah. Although I noticed Zero Hedge is on there. Yeah. Lots of people are on there, seriously. Yeah. And it, like it's it's not just Bitcoin stuff either. right? And not even just English-speaking stuff. There's a bunch of Chinese uh, notes being written there. Um, you know, Can it scale? Um, it probably has the best shot of scaling in for anything that we've seen so far, right? Right, because it's it's a very simple system, and you can you can run Nostra in many different ways, right? You can so Nostra has a client, yeah. which generates a private key, yeah. and writes a message, and then signs that message with the private key. Right? Now you have that signed message, and now you send it to a relay, a server, basically. Um, and so you send your signed message to a server, and now anyone else on this world can say, hey, dear server, dear relay, please give me all the messages that were signed by this private key, or this public key, so to say. Um, and um, now, now you've just transferred via a single centralized server, you've transferred a message. Um, but because it's a signed message, you can just duplicate it, Right? The information is non-scarce. Copy it at infinitum. Mm -hmm. Blast your message on five hundred different relay servers, right? and then they all hopefully store your store your data. Maybe a relay will only store your data if you pay for them, right? which uh, makes sense too. Um, and you why would you pay for one? Ah, uh, because that's a reliable service, right? Um, the the problem is as soon as something is free, well, uh, their spammers are just gonna come and you know send millions of messages to you per second. Right. And eventually your entire disk is full. And what do you do then? You just have to start deleting stuff. 
Right, okay. Right. Are you going to Nostrica? Uh, no, unfortunately not. Uh, I wish though. I'm thinking about it. Yeah. I said yeah. to them I want to go. I've got some football clash that I uh, haven't figured out. Yeah. All right, let's, listen, let's go back to Jorg, your hero, one of your heroes. Okay, so give people the TLDR in the book. I mean, it's pretty obvious because it's called The Ethics of Money Production, but what does he actually get into? How does he explain it? Yeah, I mean, the, the result is uh, inflating the money supply is evil. Right? And and he really, you know, takes praxeology or Austrian economics is a first principled axiom based science. So we start with axioms. Those are assumptions, mm -hmm. so to say, you know, things that we just assume to be true. Um, in the case of economics, it's basically action is purposeful behavior. Right? Humans act. That's that's our starting point. That's the only thing that we assume. And from there on out, we deduce a lot of things. You know, like humans have problems, humans use their scarce resources in order to, uh, their means in order to uh, satisfy their ends, in order to solve their problems, etc. Right? Humans mm -hmm. have, have a time preference, so satisfaction of your ends sooner is preferred to satisfaction of your ends later. later. You know, all, all these types of things, you know, what is, um, what is exchange? You know, I have a good, you have a good, uh, I value your good more than I value mine, and you value my good more than I value yours. And so there's a mismatch of our valuations. That's why we trade. Because I like your stuff more than mine. And, you know, when we exchange, we're both happier. You want this? <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, once, once we have exchange, uh, there are, uh, so then there are entrepreneurs who uh, solve problems for people, so to say. You know, yep. entrepreneurs help you to achieve your ends, to achieve your goals. Um, and they will do so only if you trade with them. Right? If, you, if you pay them with something, the question is, what do you have to give the entrepreneur so that he does the service for you? And, and then money is that good in the economy with which basically every entrepreneur wants to get paid with. Okay. Right? So regardless who's the entrepreneur, he's going to want to have that specific thing, that piece of gold, that piece of paper, that piece of Bitcoin. Right? And, and then that's the money. Right? Uh, so... He basically Hultzman works from from the axiom all the way through the to the definitions of money, um, and then analyzes the consequences of increasing and decreasing the money supply and how that affects interest rates. And interest rates is the the, the price of time, so to say, the price of money, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, how how all of this is is affected. And then you know concludes things like unemployment will go up, you know poverty will go up, etc. People will will starve and such. Um, yeah. So it's pr pretty bleak. It's pretty bleak, yeah. Stealing from people leads to pretty shitty outcomes. Well, look, we're seeing it. I mean, we see it across the country here. Everywhere. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I have to use my own country as a way to observe it. But, you know, we've got shops closing down. Mm -hmm. We've got higher poverty levels. We're meant to be richer than we ever are. You know, everyone's got iPhones and iPads yeah. and you know, electric cars. But we've got higher poverty levels than we've ever had in this country. Mm -hmm. And we've got... You know, we've got an abundance of food banks where people are going because they cannot afford to feed their family. I made this film actually here in the UK about inflation. And I went to this one food bank, I was chatting to the guy and he said, we've now got people being referred to us who are nurses. Mm -hmm. who are nurses. So their job, they go in day in, day out to the National Health Service, they work their, you know, themselves to the bone, like these long 12-hour shifts to keep people you know, healthy, to look after people. It's a tough job. My mum did it. And now these people are going to food banks because the money they earn there is not enough to be able to feed their family. Mm -hmm. They're even talking about now like these warm banks, places go where mm -hmm. people just stay warm because it's <laughs> so cold they can't afford to heat their homes. Yeah. So we're richer than we ever were, but it feels like there is a bigger divide between the rich and the poor, mm. which I guess you would say is an, a natural occurrence from yeah. theft. Yeah, exactly. Right? If, if, we've, we've, if we institutionalize theft... Uh, and and especially via money printing, then yeah, the vast majority of people gets really poor, uh, and then those few who are early at the money spigot, they're gonna get extremely rich. Like look at the last couple of years, you know, the the likes of, of Pfizer, the Pfizer company that received a shit ton of newly created money. So it's all the new vaccines and stuff, yeah. all the masks, etc. Who bought that? Well. The government, the government and yeah. with what money? Well, the one that they printed. So, which capital did they use? Not theirs. No. Capital of everyone else, mm -hmm. right? and that went to Pfizer uh, and a bunch of others, of course. Um, so, yeah, they they got rich like a lot. Hmm. So, what was it like me meeting you? 
Oh, it was amazing. Um, that was actually uh, in in Auburn, Alabama, at the Mises Institute. Oh, wow! Um, that's the Mises Institute. They they founded it like 1980 or something like this, um, uh, and they they have this building next to the Auburn uh, University uh, with a gigantic library. Man, the library there! It's oof. They have the entire personal library of Murray Rothbard. Like his personal books with his handwritten notes, <laughs> you know, I, I, I held in my hands uh, from Karl Marx, Das Kapital, you know, where Murray Rothbard made his edits in the margin. What did he say? Oh, it was hilarious. Like fucking ridiculous. He has no <laughs> idea what he's talking about. Entire paragraphs crossed through like bullshit. <laughs> Hilarious, hilarious. Yeah, I mean, I don't see an alignment with Das Capital and uh, <laughs> the Austrian eco uh, economists. Um, God, that's, a, that's what an experience to go through if somebody like you to go and see that. Yeah, it really was, was transformative. And then, so it was an entire week-long event um, where a bunch of incredibly smart professors gave lectures to young students. Um, and yeah, you know, I thought before that then sure hey i know a bunch about austrian economics you know i'm gonna breeze through the seminar hell no hell no it was super difficult and then at the end there was a quiz you know i was like Gosh, i'm gonna ace it gonna best of the class sure i barely passed it because the questions there were like tough do you remember what kind of thing really tough um yeah you know like uh like cause relations between uh you know money printing and and the inflation rate or uh, you know, how does the, the you know, an expansion of the credit system, how does that uh, affect the wage rates, et cetera? I don't know the exact phrasing of, of the questions anymore, mm. but it was just a, a, like the entire scene of Austrian economics is very broad. Like there's mm -hmm. there's just a lot of different topics that, that, that are being touched there, um, including some really, you know, deep philosophical, epistemological, like what is thinking actually? Like how do we think about things? You know, very fundamental, deep questions. What kind of deep questions do you ask yourself? Uh, what do you wrestle with? It's a really good question. Um, well, I think just the entire concept of like, what is, was, was, was Bitcoin? Okay. Like, I mean, that's a, that's a deep question that you got to wrestle with for a while. Uh, yeah, I still don't think that I'm done. Um, but that's, that's a big one. And what do you mean? Like, do you mean, what is it almost in the context of, considering how people are talking about ordinals recently is it an information system is it a money system is it that kind of question yeah exactly right like i mean like, as, as hilsman pointed out in this one paragraph that you read right it's it's a non-scarce software system that that establishes scarcity in in cyberspace but does it really like are utxos really scarce i mean they're still you know just written on software and replicated across all full nodes etc um like there's uh, yeah, and then, you know, what are the consequences of, of Bitcoin too, right? Uh, or like, are the attributes of Bitcoin good in the sense of limited money supply? Which, by the way, that's not even something that Austrians contemplated before. Like, a fixed, like, previously known and agreed upon money supply, like, that that didn't cross anyone's mind. Well, I guess because one had never existed. Yeah. They'd had a... Yeah, they'd had sound money in the form of gold, which they knew there was uh, you know, an abundant supply, but it's difficult to get to, and you know, its price in market would influence how much it's being mined. So yeah. it was a, uh, it was just something that required some proof of work. It had mm -hmm. a proof of work attached to it, unlike the money printing that just lop a zero onto the central bank reserves. But because because how else could you produce it apart from digitally? You could not produce something mm. like this. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? and um, yeah. So there's, and then of course you get in the, in the technical nuances of, of Bitcoin as well. Like there's so much to to wonder about and to break your head about. Are you wrestling hard with anything right now? Um, in like, you mean right now in this conversation? No, just, generally, <laughs> generally. Um, yeah, like right now, um, I think just that as or that 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 question if a if it's if it's good or if it's better that a monetary system is anonymous, right? And and what does anonymity mean? You know, what is privacy? Is this a good thing? Is that a bad thing? And how does it tie into Bitcoin specifically? And how, if we have considered that that having an, an anonymous monetary system is important, then how do we get Bitcoin to be anonymous? Um, 
Those are really, really big questions. So that's a philosophical one that leads to a technical one. Yeah. 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 I think like a lot of a lot of this, like I'm rooted in, in the, the philosophy of it, which which brings me to the economics of it and, and then the, the technicals uh, of it. So I would be intrigued to know if, if you're wrestling with uh, the concept of an entirely private Bitcoin, what downsides are you wrestling with in having that? Well, that when someone is anonymous, you cannot stop him from doing anything. Basically, because you don't know that he exists or or what uh -huh. exactly he's doing, right? But thing so is, certain nefarious characters. Yeah, exactly. Right. There's a bunch of people that just do really nasty things, and what happens when they have extremely powerful tools? Right. Um, that's a big question, uh, and you know what uh, what happens also when, for example, those let's say those anonymous tools exist, but they are freakishly expensive to use. Right? So only the rich can afford to be perfectly anonymous, versus the average Joe cannot. You know, so this asymmetry of power, what what does that lead to? Mm, right? I was having the same conversation when I turned you turned up. I was on the phone. I was talking to a journalist about the UK legal system. There's an asymmetry there with being rich, and you get power in the yeah. legal system, and you can crush smaller peasants who don't have maybe the capital to be able to. Uh, continue lawsuits year after year. Yeah, those asymmetries exist with money. Money is power, so it mm -hmm. always exists. Um, on the technical side of things, do you think we will get to a like natively private Bitcoin? The big question of what's natively right here. Um, so idiots like me have got it without even thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, so the uh, one big question: Do we need to change? the Bitcoin consensus rules in order for it to be private. Good luck. First of all, good luck. Second of all, even though I'm sure we could change the rules in some ways that would make it more private, ultimately, I don't think we need to. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that when we get smarter about how to use the existing protocol, that we can improve the system substantially. Right? Like things like the Lightning Network, uh, things like CoinJoin. Um, these things are just us getting smarter about how to use this crazy system that we discovered. Uh, and the, the the consequences of that are, are I think, quite great. Um, I'm extremely confident about having a, a cheap and effortless and easy to use anonymous money system that's, to some extent, we have it already now. Well, you built part of it that enables us to have that. Yeah. We talked about Wasabi, if you don't know. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a couple of questions on that. Um, but one main question, really. We've covered it a lot in the past. And, I, you know, full transparency, Max and Wasabi are sponsored of my show. But also go and check it out because they, uh, they built the McCormack-friendly version of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of Wasabi. Now, um, people are able to recognize if somebody has run their coins through Wasabi. Mm -hmm. That is something they can do. Yeah. Will you ever get be able to get to the point where they won't be able to do that? Um, yes and no. There, there are ways that you can um, improve your privacy without telling others that you are in fact using privacy-preserving technology. Okay. This type of thinking is called steganographic privacy. Okay. Right. So you you hide in plain sight. Um, there are things like, for example, PayJoin, uh, which does that. Right. So PayJoin is when I want to pay you for a pizza. Right. So I, uh, however, you add a coin that you received in the past to the input side of that transaction where I'm paying you. Right? So it's literally a coin join. The sender and the receiver both put coins into that transaction on the input side. Um, and that improves privacy in some subtle ways. But an outside observer, when they see this transaction, it's not obvious that this is in fact a pay join. It looks just like a regular payment from one guy to another guy. And right? so that's, for example, one thing. Or Another really, really interesting pro, uh, protocol by Adam Gibson uh, is Join Market, X, uh, sorry, CoinJoin XT. Um, that's like a multi-transaction ceremony with with multiple people, let's say ten people, where each of these individual transactions has like two inputs, two outputs, like so they don't look suspicious at all. Um, but you can coordinate this this network of transactions in advance. Right? So among all of this group of 10 people, we agree this is the first transaction, this is the second, etc. We pre-sign all of this. So we have this, this huge network of coordinated transactions that we then afterwards one by one publish to the Bitcoin network. 
Right? So again, we, we use the system smartly. We prepare transactions off-chain, so to say, and then slowly go on-chain to, to actually settle this entire thing. Uh, and, and this is steganographic as well. Um, coin swaps is, a, is another thing, right? Where I have a coin here and in, in one transaction, basically, that uh, like I give you that coin. In exchange, you have a coin over here and you make a transaction there and, and we kind of swap coins. So I get your transaction history, you get my transaction history, so to say. Uh, but an outside observer doesn't know that this is going on uh, at all. Right? So th these are, I think, the, the three, and even to some extent the Lightning Network, arguably, is a steganographic or can be a steganographic uh, privacy-preserving system. The thing, though, is they give little privacy. Um, uh, difficult to compare, but they give little privacy and they're quite expensive. Uh, especially join mark, uh, CoinJoin XT, um, this, this network of predetermined transactions. Many transactions require a lot of block space, lots of size, high mining fee. Right. right? So the beauty of a CoinJoin as we know it in, in Wasabi is that it's ridiculously cheap. Like, incredibly cheap compared to anything else out there. Uh, and the, the actual verifiable privacy guarantees of it are quite substantial. Hmm. Um, so it's it's very different to things like PayJoin or CoinJoin XT. Um, and it's kind of difficult to compare the two. Um, but ultimately, I yeah, I think a mix of both is, is going to be what we'll end up using. And why have you made privacy your thing? Why is this so important to you? It's a really good question. I don't know how I have my job into I this. It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> but like you really get, look, I mean, I you as a character... You know, I've got to know you a little bit more over the last year. We spent a couple of times together. We've hung out. And, you know, I can tell as a person that you you have real issues with the, the money system and government and theft and the influence they have over us. But you're not, you don't act like a radical anarchist. <laughs> um, and you could have gone and built anything. And I don't believe you're running Wasabi just because you sp just spotted an opportunity. It feels like privacy is something that it's, it's, it's mission as well, well as opportunity. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, like the ultimately, I, I don't, I'm not a privacy maximalist per se. Mm. I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist per se either. I'm I'm a really? freedom maximalist, right? I freedom to shitcoin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, freedom to yeah. shitcoin too, definitely. Yeah. And like the, you know, freedom in the sense of d not being stolen from, to be able to choose how to allocate your own resources and to be able to choose how to selectively reveal yourself. Right? That's the definition of privacy, to selectively reveal yourself to the world. That you have a choice of the words that you say to the other person, or the way that you act in front of someone else, and, and which sensitive information you reveal uh, to them. Um, for me, privacy is about human freedom, like and freedom in the sense of the opposite of slavery. If you do not have privacy, you are not a free man, you are a slave. And someone else decides over you on, on how you can act, about what you can say and what you cannot say. Right? This is no longer your choice as, as, and ability as a beautiful human being, but now it's, it's being dictated to you at the point of the gun. Um, and that's just not all right. Yeah, and it freaks people out, though. You know, when you talk about absolute free speech, we know it's important in certain scenarios, like you have very oppressive regimes where if you can just be critical of government, you can find yourself in jail or murdered. Mm. Then you have jurisdictions like the UK where you can find yourself in a lawsuit for saying things that you believe are true, but somebody would challenge you on it and consider you've libeled them and mm. taken action against you. And then you've got certain things that you can't say because of, for example, is considered a hate crime to say certain things. Trying to communicate the trade-off between uh, the moral question about you know, certain certain things people might say might be racist or homophobic, but saying what you lose by having these is a hard trade-off people to accept. People, I think, generally people want people to be arrested for hate crimes. Mm. They want it to. They want a hate crime to be a crime and people to be punished for it. They don't understand the consequences of of that lack, lack of free speech, what that can mean for them at some point in the future. And it's a really tricky thing, trying to explain these concepts. It's like trying to explain Bitcoin to people. It's like mm. trying to explain privacy to people. I think people have got so accustomed to seeing government, and, and yeah, it's a, it's a big thing for me to say this, but the government is the people who 
how do I put this? No longer, uh, no longer are they the people we elect to do a job for us. We are, they are the people, we are the people who work for them. Mm-hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so getting these concepts, trying to turn, it's like trying to turn the tanker around. It's kind of like saying, hold on, government is purely meant to represent the electorate. But we've lost that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've lost that quite quite substantially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a big issue. Um, mm. And, you know, but that's, that's again where economics uh, helped me so much. Uh, it it prov- provided me with a lot of clear ways of, of thinking about this and, and articulating it. Um, and and seeing the importance of it, and so the uh, I think that's why economic science is is so fascinating to me. How how bad can this get? Danny said to me, "You've got some pretty kind of dystopian views of where this might end up." It's going to get pretty bad. You know, so you're, the, you're you're saying that you're not saying it could. You're saying it is. It is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's unfortunately no way around it. Um, so right, what are the consequences of money printing again? Right, we malinvest, uh, we prolong our investment, our production stages. Right, we overconsume. Right, this means we like we start projects where we think we have the resources to finish them, but because we've already consumed all of our resources, there's literally not enough stone, metal, concrete to finish building the house. Right, so, but the big problem is we. Like right now, you know, we're just still in full swing of, of building the house. Every, everything's awesome. You know, everyone has, a wor- has, has work and, and we're just, you know, working on building the house. Great. Um, this is the boom period. You know, we think everyone's rich and you know, we're having a lot of fun. The, the bust comes when you realize that, oh shit, I do not have enough resources to finish building this house. Um, and... The, the sad thing is, it's not just the, the bad projects that will not have enough resources to finish. It's also the good projects. Because the good projects cannot finish because the resources that it would have needed are now invested in the bad projects and the marginally worse projects. Right? So the, the, the bust period is inevitable. In fact, the bust period is what cleans this entire mess up. Right? We've, we've made mistakes in the past by printing too much money and, and malinvesting and, and overconsuming. And the only way out of that is to reallocate those resources away from those that, uh, that, that are like bad, so to say, the, the marginally worse projects, into those marginally higher projects. Uh, and that's an extremely, extremely painful um, thing uh, because, well, I mean, you, you lose your job, you know, you lose your, uh, like you lose your roof over the, the uh, over your, et cetera. Um, and that that hurts, uh, but there's no way around it. Like the the mistakes were made in the past, and the consequences are basically unavoidable, um, which is super depressing, right? And again, that that was me like pre Bitcoin saying the same thing. Bitcoin somewhat changes this because with Bitcoin, finally, we have a monetary alternative that actually works. Hopefully, works at scale, right? And so this means that now we have a a sound monetary technology which we can use to help us in the reallocation process. Right? We need money to allocate resources. Money gives us prices. Without money, there is no price. Without prices, there is no profitability calculation. Without profit or without the ability to calculate profit, you're just floating in the dark, no idea in which direction you're going, if you're actually trending up or trending down. So the ability that we have now a monetary system that is is true in in its its total money supply with the lowest barriers of entry for anyone to be able to use that, that now helps entrepreneurs to start with their economic calculation all over again, so to say. Um, And plus, when people leave fiat currencies and sell that for Bitcoin, that means that fiat currencies hyperinflate much sooner. Right? They, they will have to print more money a lot quicker because there is now a, a drain where the capital is, is leaving out of the fiat system into the Bitcoin system. And so that hyperinflation is going to come much sooner than it otherwise would have been. And you think that's coming for Europe, coming for the US? It's coming for everywhere. Yeah. That, that's, that's like the crazy thing, right? In the past, we had hyperinflation in Weimar Republic, Venezuela, yeah. you know, like Zimbabwe. small places, yeah. right? Nobody cares about them, right? But... What happens when we have, and the thing is, right, even when you have hyperinflating economy in Weimar Republic, at least you have a sound economy outside yeah. with sound price signals, right, where you can still, where even entrepreneurs in the Weimar Republic can, can 
use those outside information to do at least a partial resource allocation. Yeah. It won't be as good as if the money in the Weimar Republic would actually be great, right? but at least there is something. The big problem is now we've hyperinflated every single fiat currency on every single piece of this planet. Mm -hmm. There is no outside measuring system that we can use. Right? Even in the Soviet Union, like in the Soviet Union, they didn't have so private property, therefore no exchange, therefore no prices, therefore no profitability. So they had no idea what the fuck they were doing. So they sent spies into the West to see what the prices for goods are, <laughs> right? So that they can oh. actually allocate, like, well, where should we spend our stuff? Well, now we're in a situation where because we've hyperinflated everywhere, our pricing is messed up everywhere. Um, and that's that's a huge 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 problem like there and bitcoin finally provides us that that kind of escape hatch yeah and this this parallel economy where we can do proper economic calculation uh and this this will accelerate the the collapse of the fiat system um however it it will lead to a better future in in the long run like the sooner we stop stealing the better if, if like the best time to stop stealing is 40 years ago. <laughs> the <laughs> yeah. second best time is now. Yeah. Um, all right, last thing I want to talk to you about before we go. This is the thing I really wanted to talk to you about. Danny was telling me about it. Hmm. Microscopic cameras. Yeah. Nano cameras. I mean, could they be in here now? We don't even know. <laughs> this is wild. You wait for yeah. this one. This is fucking wild. Danny was like, oh yeah, by the way, your private key might never be private. I was like, what? He was like, yeah, <laughs> nanotech microscopic flying fucking yeah. cameras or whatever. What is this all about? Yeah, so I was asking myself, like, um, so having anonymous money, in my opinion, is important. Um, I believe, especially with Wasabi Wallet, we've solved it. And now I'm thinking, okay, what's next? Right? Like, do do I still need to continue working on on the money? Even if if Bitcoin is now anonymous, yep, it's kind of great, right? So, what's next? You did it, Max. We can go home now. <laughs> yeah, right. It's well done, Max. Over. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be it. Money solved. Right. What's the next problem we're gonna get on with? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the next problem yeah. is: is the money actually solved though? Right? Because okay, um, in order, so Bitcoin is money of cyberspace. In order to enter cyberspace, you need to be in meat space. Mm -hmm. Right, you need to have a physical environment where your body is and where your computer is. Well, we do, right? but AI doesn't. Well, no, even the AI has to be on a computer, right? So, like every non-scarce does it digital resource it has to be ultimately anchored in in physical hardware, at least what we know currently. Distributed right? doesn't matter, right? Even if it's distributed, there's still a bunch of different physical computers. And now the the really shitty thing is like. If we do not have a secure meat space, we cannot have a secure cyberspace, right? Okay, like, I'm with you. When, you know, when your hardware wallet's on the table, this room is not secure, I come and grab it, you know, like, now your computer is gone. Uh -huh. What do you do? Your Bitcoin are no longer accessible to you, right? Um, but it's it's not, uh, it, and you know, it's, it's not just about your own physical body and and the, the, the computer that someone could physically steal. It's also uh, that, the that layer between like that meat space layer between the computer and your brain is unencrypted mm -hmm. and that's a big 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 no-no because as you say right there yeah. can be micro cameras everywhere uh, there are microphones everywhere um, and if this last mile is not encrypted then all of the securities that we can gain in cyberspace are null and void mm. you know because you type in your 24 words and the camera picks it up all of a sudden, uh -huh. your your super awesome anonymous money is no longer anonymous nor secure, right? and that's a really really big issue. How how do you solve? What do you, how do you solve that? Well, ultimately, I'm not sure. That's why. But I'm working on it. <laughs> no, not even working With on it yet. Three point zero. <laughs> well, I, um, yeah, like, I think the main thing is to encrypt the last mile. Um, Everything else is great. From your computer to any other computer, perfect encrypted. Yeah. Right? Uh, and that's great. That last mile is, is where it's at. So either we re reduce that distance, you know, let's say if I have contact lenses or something with a screen, um, then the, the camera could no longer peer in between, mm -hmm. you know. So that's that's one example. Yeah. Um, 
or then to literally have an implant into your brain <laughs> that handles <laughs> encryption in your brain. Uh, so that your brain can encrypt and decrypt the messages Max, that you send to your what computer. If they, what if they hack that chip in our brain? Sure. Right? What if they hack your hardware wallet? That's why we need free and open source hardware and software uh, to be able to verify the, the things that you run on your computer. I just want to go back to a simple life. Yeah, there's just no give going me a, back. Now. Give me a log cabin, buy a load of some books. <laughs> I think I'm getting too old for this now. There's too much going on. A microchip in my head to protect my Bitcoin. Yeah. It's not just, that's the thing. It's not just about your Bitcoin, though. Like, it's about the communications with your loved ones, right, as well. Like it's it's about your business. It's mm -hmm. it's you know about your friends and everything. I think businesses care even less about privacy than individuals, unless they've got some shit to hide. I'm not so sure about that. Yeah. Like I mean, for example, you, you have a bunch of employees. Yep. Do you tell each of them what the other person earns? Yeah, and I make them mock each other. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course I don't. You see? Of course I don't because there's. There's a reason for it. There's like people earn different amounts. One, role, two, experience, three, ability, four, short term performance. Nobody ever sees that. They see whole numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So there's a bunch of reasons. Like, you know, you in, uh, yeah. in the past you advertised your, your revenue from the podcast. Yeah. You stopped doing that. Yeah. Why? Well, I was in uh who was I with? I was in I was with Jason Williams. Mm -hmm. an American hodl and we're in America and they're like what the fuck are you doing I was like I'm trying to be transparent I want to show everyone how this works I don't want to get any accusations any accusations came that like I've been taking wrongful money it's all there all out there in the open and they're like yeah but you're also telling people what you're earning and you're putting a honeypot and fuck those guys and I was like okay yeah good point so yeah. I got rid of it but also look when I first did it it was like I was making like a thousand dollars a month mm. I never thought it would make much more than that. And yeah. it did, and it was like, okay, well, the game changed. The game changed, Max. The game changed, yeah. The game changed. But the cool thing is, right, both of the things that you did are privacy-preserving. Because a private person or a private company can choose to reveal information. Yeah. Right? Like, me sitting here in front of camera doesn't mean that I'm not valuing my privacy. Right now, I'm not valuing my secrecy about the specific words that I'm speaking. Mm. I still have a bunch of things in my head that I'm not saying. Right? So... Uh, yeah. transparency and secrecy are two sides of, of the same coin that is privacy um, and the ability though that you can choose that hey I want to be transparent I want my people to know the revenue that's great and then at a later point you're saying hey no actually this is too risky it puts not just me but also my employees at risk mm -hmm. and I, I no longer want to share this information that is at, at the very core of, of privacy and okay. I believe it's very much important for companies as well Hmm. Okay, that's fair. Well, listen, Max, uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Indeed. And uh, I appreciate you being a sponsor. I think uh, the latest incarnation of Wasabi is amazing. Anyone listening, if you haven't checked it out, just please go and check it out. It is brilliant what they've done. Um, and I wish you all the best. Do you want to send anyone to anywhere else? Well, thanks thanks a bunch for, for having me. It was really cool. Thanks for taking the sponsorship. Uh, it's, it's nice that you're spreading the word. Not just about Wasabi, but... Bitcoin on uh, no, all the freedom tech. It's really good to have proper journalists. I'm not sure if journalists, proper podcasters, you know, people spreading the gospel, shouting it from the mountaintop, super important. So well, thanks thank for you, doing man. it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and check out wasabiwallet.io. Um, there's a bunch of documentation about it. Hopefully you don't need much documentation anymore. Um, keep your wallet up to date because we're improving it a lot. Oh, yeah. And actually, um, if you have a Trezor wallet, um, and Trezor Suite, uh, you can now do CoinJoin as well. Uh, same with BTC Pay Server. Right? So um, we started to work on getting other wallets uh, to do their on-chain transactions in a CoinJoin as well. Interesting. Right? So now these three wallets, and hopefully more in the future, are making gigantic Bitcoin transactions together. Huh. Right? And hopefully, that, will, like in the long run, we will have many different wallets uh, participating in a gigantic transaction, fills up the entire block. Let's say. Love it. And at that point, we're pretty good. Uh, well, listen, keep doing it. Keep crushing it. I wonder, we're going to have to have a chat with Zafir here in a minute, our uh, resident producer of the day. See uh, see if we orange pilled her. But look, keep going, man. Uh, people love having you on the show. Let's uh, let's try and do it again before the year's out. Let's do that. That would All be right, fun. Man. Thanks a bunch. Good luck for the, for the team. Oh, we'll be we're nearly team. there, man. Oh, yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs>